Father, we just come before your throne of grace just one more time, Father. And I just thank you for the hearts of these that are here tonight that are just uh, spending time in your word and getting into a uh, intimate relationship with you that as they walk with you, Lord, again, as you just direct our footsteps and give light unto our path, Lord, we just thank you. We just ask that you would just take the reins of our lives and lead us and guide us where you want us to be, Lord. So again, Father, just speak through my lips, think through my mind, just use me as a vessel, Father, that, uh, that each person here would just be blessed by what they're learning here, Lord. So we just thank you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So, last week, uh, we took the big picture, okay? And now what we're going to do is we're going to start going into individual characters. And I'm probably thinking we're going to be going through Genesis for the next uh, three, four weeks. Um, we're going to be starting off in... Um, oh, I wanted to give you this. I thought this was very interesting. Unfortunately, Miss Sandy, can you go to my printer and grab it this? It should be. I think I left it open. This here, guys, uh, I'm going to give it to you because I think it was very interesting. And what this is, is the lives, the lifeline of from Adam all the way down to Joseph. <clears throat> Adam lived up to be 930 years. Seth lived on to being about 912 years. But what I want you guys to do is look at this map, uh, look at this uh, timeline, I guess would probably be a better way. And when I came across this, what really got me interested in this is first is the area where the flood actually took place. Okay, so we have Noah, he built the ark, the flood's happening. But what is interesting is when you come down to the end of Noah's life, if you kind of follow on down, there's a good chance that Abraham was alive at the time of Noah, or I should reverse that and say Noah could have been alive at the time of Abraham, which left me kind of befunkled on that one because I was like, you know, could you imagine Tara sitting down with Abraham and saying, let's go talk to your great, 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 grandpa. You know, that's just was awesome to me. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I want you guys to have it. You know, again, we're going to be, I'm going to hand out a lot of handouts just because I want, the biggest thing I want you guys to see is how God has the work that he went through to show us who he is, how mighty he is, how, what a perfect designer that God is. So that's what we're going to be going over. <clears throat> so here we are in our map of Abraham's life. Okay, this is where it all started. <clears throat> This will probably have a good portion of our test next week. And this one was very interesting. Just the travels that he went through. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and turn on our Bibles. Did everybody bring their Bibles this week? Mm -hmm. We're going to start off our Bible study in... Genesis 11, and we're going to be at the very, very end of Genesis 11, at verse 31. While you guys are turning there, I have decided to break Abraham's life up into uh, this part of it, into three sections, okay? The first one is going to be the beginning part of uh, Abraham's journey. The Bible takes a moment to stop and turns its eyes onto a battle or a war of what had been known as the War of the Nine Kings. 
And then from the War of the Nine Kings, it goes back to Abraham's life. And then it starts to kind of turn off to Lot and the family of Abraham, etc., cetera, such, such as that. So we're going to start off in... Um, Start off in Ur. Ur was a... Uh, let me back up. So Terah is the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Scripture says that Haran had passed, had died before they left Ur. So when Terah had made the decisions to go ahead and leave Ur, he was taking Abraham and Nahor. Abraham was already married to what was called Sarai. His name was Abram at the time. And Nahor was married to Micah. Okay, so this is the family that they're taking. Now, this journey that they're going to be going up on is approximately a 610-ish mile hike. Okay? Starting off here at Ur, which, as we remember is going to be at the bottom area towards the Persian Gulf. This area here was a known as an archae ar archaeological discovery that has been unequivocal at that time. And it was a major urban center at the Mesopotamia Plains. Okay, So this was a very big and plentiful area. They have found royal tombs that have confirmed its splendor. These tombs date back to about 24, 25 BC, and they contained immense amounts of luxury items and precious stones, precious metals. All of these precious stones and precious metals were imported from a long distance from Iran, Afghanistan, India, Asia Minor, Persian Gulf area. And his wealth was very well known and is a testimony to the uh, Ur's economic importance. Ur was also a major part of the, major, uh, the Persian Gulf, which extended further inland, and that's, we think that it came in a little bit further, that there was rivers coming off here, hence where I believe the Garden of Eden was at. And that it also had a variable type of society. It could have had slaves captured uh, foreigners, it had farmers, artisans, doctors, scribes, priests, High-ranking priests apparently enjoyed the great luxury of living in mansions. In their history of discovering here, they have found thousands of texts, uh, records of texts, including contracts, business records, court documents, records, and city complex uh, economic and legal systems. And these have been discovered in their temples, in their mansions, and even in their regular homes. Okay, so when they, when they left Ur, I have described something that's a very, very large city, very well known, very populated, and they started their journey going up the Euphrates River. Again, there are stories that said that they took the Tigris River up, but I am a believer that they took the Euphrates Rivers up, but this is what the Euphrates River looks like as you're going up. This is another one. The Tigris River follows the same beauty. Very green right around the river. Very beautiful. So this changed my mind to what I thought Abraham was looking for. Because I'm thinking old dirt, rocks, mesas. When I started realizing that they're walking up a mountain, I mean a, a river path, it changed my mind on how it looked as they were going up. On their trip up this 600-mile hike, they ran into these things that are called ziggurats. Ziggurats were just large, I'd almost say like the, the pyramids of Egypt, but they were almost like their own metropolis. You can see that they have houses that were built on the outside. People are coming and going. Uh, I think this is one that has been un, un, um, uncovered but it has like a little temple up here. So it's believed that there was a lot of temple worship in these. But what was very interesting, here's one that actually looks like it's being 
discovered and it looks like they're starting to just take it apart. But look at the mass size of that. It is a very, very large architectural genius, if you will. But as it was going up through there, it is said that there could have been about 32 of these on his trip from Ur following up the Euphrates River up to Haran. So not only was it a very green walk, a very lush walk, plenty of, of water and fishing and whatever, but it was also very busy. It's almost like what I would think of Central is on, you know, back when Albuquerque was young. It was the main strip. It was a trade, trade line that they traveled. When they were going up this area, they came up to a place called Haran. Haran was the 600 miles. If you're figuring, I looked it up, that's about a 20 mile average a person can walk. Okay, that's a, that's a kind of a general 20 miles a day. So you're figuring if it's 600 miles away, you're looking at at least a 30 day walk if they walk 20 miles a day. If they had animals, later when we talk about in Joseph, uh, excuse me, in Jacob, when he had had all of his animals, he said, go ahead of me. I'm not going to push these animals further than they can go because I'll die. So it could have been a much shorter walk. So it could have been longer than the 30 days. So um, we're going to, we're going to real quickly, I want to go through chapter 12, just the first part here. It says, now the Lord said, to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make a, na a name great and you shall be blessed. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth and you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Does anybody know what this is called? If anybody took the Old Testament, Old Testament survey, what's this called? The Abrahamic covenant. Exactly. So that's taking place when uh, Abraham has now come up to Haran. This is where Terah had brought him up. They stayed up here for a while. Terah ended up dying. And that's when God came into the picture again and said, it's time for you to go. And the Abrahamic covenant was taking place. Okay. What is interesting is I show you the great pictures of the Euphrates and the Tigris River and how lush it was and how busy it was. Well, you'd be shocked that when they got to Haran, this is what they might have saw. These are little homes that they lived in. As you pull back to a further distance, they look a little bit more like that. And very well could have been a very dry Mesa type atmosphere. To me, I would be wondering, why am I here? How come I didn't go back to, to Ur where everything was good, you know? Instead, you're up here in Haran where it's a lot drier. But God intervenes and says, um, I will bless you. And that's, that's, so from there, he goes to a place called Shechem. So from Haran, now he's going all the way down to Shechem. I'm a believer that he's on the other side of the Jordan River. Some people have him crossing here at the Jordan River. But either way, he ended up here at Shechem. When he got to Shechem, Scripture says that the Lord appeared to him and that he built an altar there. Okay? So... Shechem could have looked like this. What's interesting is you hear the Mount Ebal and the Mount Gerizim, and there's a thing the pastor talks about, I think renewing the covenant or something in Nimrod, Joshua, I don't remember, I mean, uh, Numbers, Joshua. Nonetheless, Shechem sits right in the valley. It's a natural amphitheater. It says, this valley formed a natural amphitheater. A speaker's voice could be heard on both hillsides. Likewise, the shout of a crowd from Gerizim could be heard on Mount Ebal and vice versa. 
So it was a perfect amphitheater. But Shechem sat right in the valley of the two. Some of the things that we're going to learn, I don't know what you guys think of when you think of a mount, but I look at our mountains and yeah, they're mountains, but there's some mounts, you know, and I still look at them to be very large. One of the things for those that you guys have been to Israel already, already know that these are mounts. They're much shorter, they're much smaller than I would have expected. So as I've been studying this, going through the Valley of Hinnom, the Kidron Valley, the Mount Zion, all these different places, it's a whole different mindset as I've been going through this, which has been a blessing to me because one day when I get to Israel, uh, who's been here? Who's been to Israel? So does this remind you? Does this bring back memories of what it looks like? Okay, so it's really, really awesome. So from Shechem, he came down to a place between Bethel and Ai. And here it says that he called on the name of the Lord and he built another altar. I want to say, let me see if I got it in my notes here. I think it's from Hebron. So from Hebron, which is down through here, going back up to Haran where he was at is about a 410 mile hike. So this is no small Sunday cruise. This is a very large, life-changing experience. So when you get down to Bethel and Ai, what's even, <laughs> what's even more, I, I, I couldn't find a lot on Bethel and Ai. Um, if there's ever pictures that you guys want to hand over to me as I'm going through this, I'd love to have them. Because Bethel, uh, this is Bethel here. These are said that these are ruins from when uh, Joshua went in and attacked Bethel and Ai and Jericho and all that. Have this little ruin here. So again, you're back in that dirt atmosphere um, that, again, you know, I, I don't know what Abraham was thinking when he was going through this. You know, if he's got his family and he's traking through this, what would you guys think? You know? So, now from Shechem and Ai, you have your map there. So now we're sitting over here. Now, there's a famine in the land. Okay? It's pretty much taken over pretty aggressively. So Abraham makes a decision to go to Egypt. So, naturally, I'm thinking that he went through here. Somewhere in here, th this is a little off. The Negev is a region, or the Negev, or the, however you want to pronounce it. So when he came down through here, the Bible says he went through the south. I have found that whenever you hear the south in the scriptures, that it's talking about the Negev. Okay? Now this was beyond me. When you go into the Negev, this is what you see in the evening sky. This changed my view, no, not changed my view, I guess it gave me a view of when God promised Abraham that he was going to make his seed as plentiful as the stars. Count the stars, if you will. And this is the Milky Way coming through here. Could you only imagine what it'd be like sitting underneath the stars? And I have this video and I wish I, wish I could have brought it so I could show you, but Abraham, when God promised him seed, that he was going to have Isaac, and that he was going to have descendants like the stars of the, of the sky, he was sitting outside just in awe of how many stars were in the sky. So when I came across this, I was like, it's too much. God is too much. I mean, promising us a world like that, totally awesome. If that's not stunning enough, going into the Negev, this is one of the desert pictures going through the Negev. Again, hand-painted. God's colors are dynamic. You know, this is just captured as a picture, but I mean, when you look through it, look at how beautiful that is. I would only imagine it's hot, according to Pastor Sinai's story, but... Um, Beauty. Okay? So he gets down into Egypt. 
Let's see. Okay, so now he's down in Egypt. This is where, do you guys remember the story where uh, Abraham, Abram, went to Sarai, Sarai and tell her, okay, don't tell Pharaoh you're my wife. Tell him that you're my sister. Okay? That is what took place in this journey. So now they're down in Egypt. The famine is pretty vicious. So they're staying here. Scripture says that with Sarah, Pharaoh blessed Abraham and gave him a large amount of cattle and silver and gold and a lot. But then God came and said, the woman that you're with is married. You know, it's not, he's another man, it's another man's wife. So then Pharaoh comes back over, gets upset and says, you guys have to leave. So now we have uh, Abraham coming back up into Bethel and Ai. <clears throat> When they get to Bethel and Ai, they have a lot of animals. And in this, Lot has a lot of animals. So now it gets to the point where uh, what I'm giving you here is Abraham's journey. It kind of takes you through the mileage of what you're seeing here. I should have handed this out earlier. So you see from Ur to Haran, 600 miles. From Haran to Shechem is 400 miles. So it is Shechem. I was thinking it was Hebron. Shechem to Bethel, 20 miles. Bethel to Egypt, 225 miles. Egypt back to Bethel. Bethel to Mamre, about 35 miles. And then Hebron to Hobah, which we're going into now. Um is another 160 miles, give or take, okay? So, this is where the story gets interesting to me because let's go back and let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, let's turn to chapter 13, verse 10. Chapter 13, verse 10. You guys there? It says, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, and that is well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of, what's it say? The garden of the Lord. Okay. So the argument now sits, where's Sodom and Gomorrah? When you read that, they're right here. Traditionally, Sodom and Gomorrah is here. How does, well, how does Lot see the Jordan of River, uh, the, the valley of the Jordan, and go park his tent close to Sodom? So what, possibly, I'm going to stick with tradition. Everything that we're doing here is going to be tradition, okay? But this is what the Jordan Valley looked like, at least in this particular picture. So he looks out and he sees this. He's like, I'm going this direction. Because remember that Abraham told him, he says, you go one direction, I'll go the other. If you go this direction, I'll go that direction. It's okay. You pick one, I'll pick the other. Lot picked here. So when you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, if he came across and saw the beauty of the Jordan Valley, which is in on the right side of the Jordan here, is, is the technical valley, he might have crossed over, in which case they're doing some discoveries right here that they think, according to Pastor, might be where Sodom and Gomorrah is at. But for our story, <clears throat> oh, so let me back up. So for our story, he's going to be coming down this way to Sodom and Gomorrah and Zor there. Okay? So there's the Jordan River Valley, the Jordan Valley. <sighs> Scripture says that from Bethel and Ai, that Abraham dropped down to Hebron or Mamre. Seemingly, I don't know if I have it on your little map there, but <laughs> okay, so when we look at Albuquerque, then you have that uh, 
El Ranchito that's right there on 4th and Osuna area. And then you go into Taylor Ranch. And then you go into Corrales. Then you go into Rio Rancho. So you have all these little towns, okay? Seemingly to have the same idea. You have a place that's called Hebron. Right above it is a place called Mamre. Okay, and that's where he said that he dropped down to. So this is Hebron, probably more of a modern look. So it's, this is probably not what he saw, but we can see that it's definitely a pretty good sized town. This is where he was at. Again, when I was reading this, before I started doing this, I'm thinking that when it said that Abraham dropped down to, to Hebron, memory, like he's the only person there, <laughs> you know? He pitched a tent and said, memory, okay? But as I've gone through this and I'm seeing how big these towns were, they're no small things, okay? They're, they're pretty busy, okay? That's the beginning part of Abram's life. Now the Bible takes its eyes off of Abraham and turns it to Lot, okay? So from Lot, we're going to be going into chapter 14. I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. Because of our break in the in the when we first got here, I'm gonna I'll, I'll end it here, so we're gonna be a little bit behind per the curriculum. But nonetheless, the nine kings. Okay, you have the four kings that I believe are the four kings of the east, which are here. The five kings are here. This is where, when we were doing the bonus question on the borders of the Canaanites, these are the ones. You got Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim. It's actually a Bella, I think is what it's called, and then Adma. These are the five kings. I believing in this. I started to believe in this because of the four kings on the east. Shinar. Who's Shinar? Who's, who's the king of Shinar? No. He had that whole region. Who is the king of this whole region? Oh, Nimrod. Nimrod, right? So Shinar. And then you have Elisar. And then you have Goim. And then you have Elam. Well, my life changed when I came across this map. This map makes a little bit better sense to me. Because now you have Elam that is on the far side. Ah, uh, shoot. You'll have to forgive me because I'm going to have to do it by memory. Oh no, it's right there. So Elam is the king of Elam is Shadalamer. Shetel Thank you. <laughs> and this is the country of Iran. You have Shinar, or Shinar, who is the country of Babylon, and that's Amraphel. Amraphel very well could have been Nimrod. I was talking to Lee, and he just gave me a whole Hebrew lesson on Nimrod. I'll spare you that, because that man, he's got too much in his head. Okay? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I could listen to him all night, man. I could just, I just need to record him. Anyway, and then you have Elisar in through here, which is uh, in Turkey area. And uh, Ariok is, is the king of that. And then you have Goim. And this is where I changed because Goim, the, it's name, his name is Title, the king of nations. So when I saw this, we have four nations. And I thought, king of nations. I'm going to go with that because it's multiple nations of it. Okay. Now, the kings that were over here, which are no longer there because they're on the other map, they were under Shadalamer's uh, control, wherever he's at. Okay. They rebelled, and now he's angry, and it's all over. So he's going to be coming up the Euphrates River, and then he's going to be coming down on the Ashtaroth Karnaim, Ham, Shave Karathaim. He's going to come down into Seir, into El Paran, the town of the, uh, the Amalekites, and Kadesh, Bener, uh, Kadesh Barnea, and Hazar Tamar, which is in through here. 
he's mad. He's just going to wipe the whole place out. So then the five kings here, Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, Bela, and um, Adma, they all meet in the Valley of Siddim. The Valley of Siddim seems to be sitting right here on the southern part of, let's see if I have a different picture. Here we go. So, Karnium, Ashtaroth, down into El Paran. Karnesh Benia, Tamar, um, Zor, Sodom, in this region, okay? They just annihilate everything. If there's a time that you get tired of all the handouts, just let me know. But I think they're pretty handy telling the story. So now, the area that they came down, this here, is also named uh, the King's Valley, the Valley of the Kings. What is it? The King's Highway, excuse me. King's Highway. So they come in, they tear it all up. I'm a believer that after they came in and hit this area here, and they met them in the Valley of Siddim, that they came back on this side and went home. Otherwise, Abraham would have ran into them over here. Okay, or, or at least Abraham would have known that there was five kings attacking, or the four kings attacking. Okay, so I'm thinking that he went, um, the, the picture that I'm going to show you now, Okay, so again, here's the Kara theme. Sodom and Gomorrah comes down in through here, attacks up through here to Kardash. You can see the lines back up into the Valley of Siddim. Okay, and then again, I think he comes back and goes home this way. Okay? Now, when he, when he has taken over the Sodom and the Gomorrah area, he took captivity of Sodom, Gomorrah, Zor, that whole bottom area. Well, who lives here? Do you remember who I said is living that saw the green valley of the Jordan? Lot. Lot. Okay. So Lot left the Bethel and Ai. He came down into the Sodom and Gomorrah. He's in the dead smack middle of this war. So the five, the four kings come down, take captive all this, and then they take them up to Dan, uh, Damascus, up to a place at the very top of the land. Don't have it. Here's Damascus. Hobah is right above here. So a guy escapes. He comes running all the way down to Abraham, Abram, and he says, Abram, I hate to tell you this, war broke out. Four kings are upset. They wiped out the whole area. Everybody's been taken captive, and Lot is among the captives. Abraham rallies up, and I love this. I love this. The four kings come over, wipe this whole section out with the four kingdoms. Abraham rallies up 318 men. And he says, ready, boys? We're going to fight. He leaves the uh, Bethlehem, or the he's in Hebron, comes up, goes up into Dan, up into Damascus, up into Hobah. Oh, there's Hobah there. Okay. And conquers the four kings that just wiped out this whole area. That's a pretty good fight. When you put your trust in God, he'll take you through all this. So now he goes up, he gets Lot. Probably gives him a bash on the hand saying, I told you not to do that. Because <laughs> you don't play with Sodom. Because what's Sodom known as? It's a, it's a place of the world, right? Okay. So he's playing with the world, gets sucked in. Bam. You become a prisoner. So now, as he's coming back down, okay, and this I have to set up because this is this story is unbelievable, and then I'll probably go ahead and spare you guys f for the evening. Let's go to verse 17 of chapter 14. Chapter 
14, verse 17. It says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. The valley of Shaveh is going to be, where is Jerusalem? Somewhere, let's say in here. Okay? Somewhere in there. That is where the valley of Shaveh is. Uh, don't have it, but let's just say it's in between like Salem and Bethel, right into here, uh, Bethlehem. Okay. And it says that the five kings, that is the king's valley and his return from the defeat of Shadalomer and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, I'm sorry, back up to 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Shadalomer and the kings who were with him, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the God Most High. All right. Remember the whole thing that I was telling you maps are not just maps? Here we go. You guys know the story all too well about Melchizedek. Melchizedek, his name means the, the king of righteousness, right? He is the king of Salem. What's Salem mean? King of peace. Peace. So you have the king of righteousness and the king of peace. This priest of God, the Most High, we know that he had no father. According to scriptures, he doesn't have any beginning. So he has no beginning. He has no mother. He's without genealogy. Have neither a beginning of days nor end of life. Made like unto the Son of God, and he abideth as a priest continuously. We know from the New Testament that Jesus is also recognized in the order of Melchizedek, right? Uh, he received tithes from Abraham, and he blessed Abraham. So, here comes my story. Where is Abraham from? From a little town called Ur. Ur means the place of flames. Before we met Jesus, where were we headed? Place of, Place of flames. God came to him and says, I'm going to take you to Canaan, which is what? The promised land. When we get into Jesus, where's our destiny ending? In the promised land, right? Uh, heaven, maybe. Melchizedek, the high priest, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, which is the king of peace, without father, mother, genealogy, no beginning of days, no end of life, priest continuously. Here we go. Here's the king of Salem, which is the peace. Now, Bera, the name Bera means the evil one. Sodom means the place of burning. So you have the evil one coming out to Abraham and who is the the evil one from the place of burning who's coming out to Abraham. Abraham's being met by the righteous king, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. How many times in our lives do we have that crossroad where Satan comes to meet us and said, whatever. Here's, here's, here's the part that made my hair tingle. When, when he's talking here, he says, Oh, I'm not going to find it right away. He tells them, he says, you can have the spoils of the war. He says, I'm not here for the spoils of the, world, of the war. He says, just give me the people. That word here, people, translates souls. You can have the whole world. Just give me your soul. Does that take you guys back to another place where our king of peace, our righteous king, was taken up to a high place where Satan said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all of them if you bow down and give me your soul. To sit down and worship him. Again, here's another map of Jesus making himself real so we can find him, you know? So... There's no excuse. And so when we get to heaven and, and God, says, you know, God says, there's no excuse. When I see these things, there is no excuse, right? Uh, 
Um, Yes. Now the kings of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. That literally means souls. And what was interesting is Abraham said, no, 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 I don't want the spoils. He didn't take anything from the king of Sodom, Bera, because when it was over and done with and, and, and Abraham became big, because of the promise of God, he doesn't want anybody taking claims that made him rich. Same idea that when Christ came, he didn't take anything from anybody. It was his glory and his glory alone. Can I have two more minutes of your time? Or are you done? Real quickly, we're going to go into chapter 16. I'm going to destroy this. So we'll bounce back a little bit before. So now... Sarah is old. She can't have kids. She makes this wonderful decision to have Hagar become the mother of Abraham's children to carry on the line. She says, it's too late for me. She has, she gets pregnant. Sarah now feels like she's giving her the stink eye. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Edit that if you need to. Okay. Um, and like, she's angry. She's angry at Abraham. This video, I'm going to see if I can bring it since we're going to have to go back to this. And what it is, is Sarah sitting outside working on whatever she's doing. And off to the side, so she's looking this way, off to the side over here is the tent of Hagar. And you see Abraham, Abram, pop out, open up the tent. Hagar is sitting covered like she's in bed with, with Abraham coming out. And Sarah looked at Abraham with disgust. Like, how dare you do this? And I'm sure he's looking at us like, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> okay? It's the woman that you gave me. Huh? That just came, right? So, uh, so she gets mad. She freaks out. She takes off. She comes over here to this. Uh, this is the range of on her way to Shur. She was actually heading to this place called Shur. But God caught her in a place called, she called the, this is Kardesh uh, Barnea in the wilderness of Shur. She came to a well. That's probably not the well, but she came there. And she called it Bir Lohorai, which meant the God who hears. And I want to make sure that I got that right. Oh, yeah, I list the dag blast it. That fight that took place in the kings was also against the ones that were called giants, the Nephilim or something. Um, nope, don't have it. But it was the God who hears because she was out there crying. She doesn't know what to do. And God came to her and says, you are going to give birth to a child and you're going to name him Ishmael because I have, no, Ishmael means God hears. Bila Harai means God sees. And what was very interesting is how many of you would like to have a God who's omnipotent, omni, uh, omniscient and omnipresent, you know? And that's what I loved about this story is that Oh, I put it in my story over here. That's why I did it. So God here, uh, Ishmael means God hears. She called the place Bir Lohorai, which means you are the God who sees. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Everything that God said would happen has taken place. Right after that, it goes into the war, the, um, it goes into the Sodom and Gomorrah. These are pictures of what they believe is Sodom. Oh, you know what? I'm going to stop right there. There's too much in there that I want to kind of touch base on. So, uh, did I give you guys this one yet? Mm -hmm. I did. And I think I gave you that one. And I gave you the, the main one. Okay. 
Oh, what I did not give you was this one. This goes back to the five kings of the one that I believe are the um, king of nations. So, I will beg of you guys that you tolerate my handing out of copies. Um, one of the biggest things, and I hope that this is what happens, is this, is this giving you some visual of kind of what's taking place and how it's all unfolding? The more that I'm going over and I'm studying this with you guys, it's amazing. I feel like I'm there. I'm like, it's almost being in, the, in, in there. And there's this cartoon that my son likes watching, super, super Bible, super... Anyway, and it's that they go back in time and they get to see how it happens. That's what I feel like I'm doing with this. So I encourage you guys to go back, read through the chapter. Um, there's going to be a combination on the test that are going to have... Um, A lot of it's going to be where he started, where he went, how he came down. So this is going to be journey one. And we will probably do, how about we do something that you guys just give me the trail of how he came down during the war. Um, and maybe a little bit of description on what took place during the Nine Kings. What do you guys think? Definitely want you guys to follow because this map here is going to be the map that we're going to be building on. I'm trying to make a master map of this. <laughs> it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm going to bring in a map the size of the wall here soon. Okay. But so know this one for sure. Know a little bit about the kings. Okay. I think after that, um, I should probably say more of the kings. Know where the kings are from. Okay? So let's close in prayer. Dear Holy Father, I just thank you again for this opportunity just to come in here and share your word. And Lord, I just pray that the fire just gets... I'm so excited. I'm not even going to be able to sleep tonight, Lord. So I just thank you so much for this opportunity. In your precious name, we just give you praise. Amen and amen.